it takes some serious courage to explore active volcanoes. Sure, there may not be boiling magma spewing out of the top while you're traversing the hardened lava around the base. But assuring yourself that the mountain won't suddenly take its anger out with a violent burst of ash and fire can be tough. Kaka Singson is the kind of guy who doesn't shy away from the challenge. But while exploring the Mauna Loa Forest Reserve in Hawaii, he stumbled upon something he knew didn't look right, and when he realized what it was, he knew he was in trouble. Kaka Singson's a media personality and devoted adventurer who hosts an online show called Everything Hawaii. He takes viewers to the most scenic areas of the archipelago, and he doesn't shy away from the more dangerous areas, either. That includes volcanoes yeah, those massive mountain peaks that spew thousands of tons of ash and molten hot lava every so often. And Hawaii, the large island within the state, has five of them scattered throughout its landmass. Kaka wanted to take a solo adventure around the volcanoes, so he journeyed into the Mauna Loa Forest Reserve. It didn't take long before he came upon a massive opening in the trees that made him gasp. It was an enormous crater pit caused by the Mauna Loa volcano. This was one of three active volcanoes on Hawaii. Even though it was risky to explore, Kaka powered on towards the formation. He needed footage for his show. There was some danger involved, of course, but he wasn't too worried. Around each of the volcanoes are lookout points where experts and researchers can keep an eye on any activity. If a volcano was getting aggressive, they could give ample warning. Meanwhile, as he hiked, he was well aware there was a chance of stumbling upon batches of lava that hadn't completely hardened yet. One step could instantly cost him a foot, so Kaka was super cautious. He had with him a camera and tripod, so he could capture some great footage for the newest episode of Everything Hawaii. As he was looking through his lens, he spotted something odd in the distance. So, he packed up his camera and carefully made his way over the hardened formations until he reached a rusted metal object protruding from a mass of lava. He bent down to get a closer look. At first, he was completely confused. It looked like an old rusted soup bowl, the lost cargo of an explorer from decades ago. But then he looked closer and realized just how dangerous this item was. It was an undetonated bomb. Kaka stood up and his jaw hit the floor. What was a massive bomb doing wedged into hardened lava? Then, he turned his head and gasped again. There was a second bomb not too far away. It too, was stuck inside a mound of rock-hard magma. What the heck were two live bombs doing inside Mauna Loa? Kaka had a pretty good idea. Back in the 1930, there was a man named Thomas A. Jagger, a volcanologist. This guy dedicated his life to learning everything he could about volcanoes, and he founded a famous observatory in Hawaii. It was called the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, and it served as the main hub where scientists and researchers studied the activity of all five volcanoes of Hawaii. Even though two weren't active, experts could never be sure they'd stay that way. Jagger and his team of experts worked tirelessly to ensure they were able to gather enough information to protect residents of Hawaii from volcanic activity. The team was truly tested in 1933 when Mauna Loa erupted. The United States Geological Survey wrote, following a Mauna Loa summit eruption in 1933, Jagger predicted that a flank eruption would occur on the volcano within two years and might threaten the town of Hilo. His hoped his prediction didn't come true. But in 1935, Mauna Loa blew again and the nearby town of Hilo was in grave danger. Jagger, along with his team, scrambled to come up with a safe solution, which depended upon the Army Air Corps. The plan was to have a military plane drop 20-pointer bombs onto the land surrounding the pools of lava that were collecting to create new channels to divert to Hilava from Hilo's path. The military agreed. Smithsonian Magazine wrote, through complicated and sustained efforts, like cooling lava with water or building barriers to stop the flow, a volcano's eruption can sometimes be redirected. Miraculously, it worked, but Kaka found the two bombs that never exploded. Kaka came across a decades-old piece of history, and he knew the importance of the volcano bombing process. He caught great footage for his show and was always looking for more opportunities to teach his viewers. He was curious about other Pacific Islands too. Since their discovery in the 16th century, the Galapagos Islands have captivated visitors with their diverse array of flora and fauna. Over 200 species call the archipelago home, most of which can only be found on the islands. The islands are perhaps best known for their giant tortoises, most of which live well beyond 100 years old. Galapagos finches are also prevalent, the very same that inspired Charles Darwin's theory of evolution more than 150 years ago. Yet most people don't realize that the Galapagos Islands are highly volcanic. 
In fact, on Darwin's first voyage to the area in 1835, he actually referred to it as that land of craters. Isabella Island the largest of the Galapagos is home to five active volcanoes alone, including the imposing Wolf Volcano. The highest peak in the Galapagos, Wolf Volcano also features some of the area's most treacherous terrain. This wasn't enough to deter the American and Ecuadorian herpetologists that set their sights on Isabella in late 2019. Their journey wasn't going to be one of light walks and tortoise photos, however. They had a species to save. That species was the Canolophus marthi, more commonly known as the pink land iguana. Critically endangered with only around 200 mature individuals remaining, the pink land iguana can only be found in the areas surrounding Wolf Volcano. The scientists were seeking to document the remaining iguanas in the hope of better understanding the unique needs of the dwindling population. But the journey from the small entry island of Baltra to the treacherous peaks of Wolf Volcano wasn't going to be an easy one. It takes a long, very expensive expedition, and once you get there you have to climb the slopes of the volcano, which takes a lot of effort and a big team, said herpetologist Alejandro Ortega, director of science for the research and ecotourism group Tropical Herping. Still, the team wasn't going to let a few big rocks and some molten magma get in the way of their mission. After arriving at the Seymour Airport on Baltra, the herpetologists chartered a boat and set sail for the port village of Puerto Villamil. The team then embarked on a grueling trek through the mountainous terrain of Isabella Island. Along the way, they traversed several of the island's most active volcanoes, dodging magma with each step they took. Finally, after days of hiking, the group arrived at Wolf Volcano. They steadily scaled the steep slopes of the towering mountain, though when they reached the top, there were no pink land iguanas to be found. Instead, the scientists found themselves face to face with several creatures. They were geckos, this they were certain of, yet something about them made the team feel like they were worth paying a little extra attention to. After tracking down and snapping photos of the pink land iguana population, the team returned to collect tissue samples from the unusual geckos. These samples were then sent to University of San Francisco de Quito back in mainland Ecuador, where researchers there confirmed the herpetologist's inkling, these geckos were all brand new species three of them, to be exact. This brought the grand total of gecko species in the Galapagos up to 12, with 11 of them completely native to the islands. The first new species was dubbed Philodactylus andisabini, aka Sabin's leaf-toed gecko, after Andrew Sabin, the philanthropist who'd funded the expedition. Along with the pink land iguana and the tortoise species Chelonoidus becchi, this gecko is completely endemic to the Wolf Volcano area. Next came the Simpsons leaf-toed gecko, Philodactylus simpsoni, which was actually discovered on an expedition back in 2014. The original discoverer, Omar Torres Carvajal, failed to label the species at the time, so Artiga and company decided to name the gecko after conservationist Nigel Simpson. The third species Philodactylus moresi, or the the mare's leaf-toed gecko, was originally deemed a subspecies of Philodactylus galapagensis in 1973. However, advanced genetic testing revealed that the mares was, in fact, its own unique species and was subsequently labeled as such. The team's enthusiasm was short-lived, however, as they quickly realized that, like many other Galapagos species, these geckos were at risk of extinction. With the entire population contained to Isabella Island, one large lava flow could easily wipe them all out. When you combine this with the fact that there are still introduced predators in the area, especially cats and black rats explained Artiga, it definitely qualifies as endangered. With these three new species properly identified, herpetologists could devise tailor-made approaches to their conservation and protection. They studied all kinds of preservation efforts, like those on Phillip Island, a small community just south of Melbourne, Australia. Each year, Phillip Island makes a real splash with its penguin parade. Visitors eagerly line up to watch the adorable wildlife make trips to and from the shore. But the parades might just end soon for good. The aptly named little penguin is the smallest variety of penguin, with a weight of approximately 2 pounds. In the past, you couldn't look anywhere in Phillip Island without spotting a couple of them. But recently, their numbers were thinning. Due to an influx of foxes and other predators, the helpless penguins found themselves hunted down at an extreme rate. On one gruesome day, predators killed 180 of the poor penguins. By 2015, conservationists could only find six penguins on the entire island. Park rangers on Phillip Island had a real problem on their hands. Aside from the tourism revenue that kept the reserve going, the near extinction of the little penguins threatened the entire ecosystem. Nobody was quite sure what to do. But then a colorful chicken farmer named Swampy Marsh stepped forward. 
He had a trick he used in his everyday work that he figured might just save the plummeting penguin population. To keep his flock of chickens safe from any would-be hunters, Swampy invested in a few Marema sheepdogs to prowl his fields. These born herders chased away predators while also moving the birds to safer locations when needed. If the Maremas could shield some chickens, he wondered, could they do the same for penguins? Phillip Island understood they had no other real option. They got to training some dogs as soon as they could. Before long, Phillip Island set the dogs out on guard patrol. The Maremas didn't even have handlers with them. A self-reliant breed, they alone covered the expanse of the island. The park rangers waited with bated breath. Sure enough, the sheepdogs did the trick. Foxes and other predators fled to the mainland, and the little penguin community started bouncing back. Soon, in fact, their numbers climbed back into the triple digits. The Marema experiment was such a success that it inspired a family film called Oddball. However, another species threatened the struggling birds. Mankind. Man-made disasters pose possibly the biggest threat to endangered species all over the world. For the little penguins, recent oil spills off the Australian coast wreaked havoc to their habitat. Fortunately, conservation groups stepped in to help clean up the animals in their homes. But one quick scrub couldn't wash away the entire problem. The oil spill can cause longer-lasting problems, like reducing the penguins' ability to retain body heat. As luck would have it, a novel solution would come from these hulls in southwest Australia. But make no mistake, this was no laboratory or gifted school. The penguin savior would come from a nursing home. Alfie Date was already remarkable, as he held the title of Australia's oldest man. Nevertheless, even at 109 years of age, he still had the energy to make a difference. Moved by the penguin's story, he pulled out some yarn and his knitting needles. With no time to lose, Alfie started knitting up a storm. A stack of colorful garments piled up next to his chair. Once Alfie's hands couldn't make one more stitch, he called the nurses to ship his hard work off to Phillip Island. Crazy as it sounds, Alfie knitted sweaters for the penguins and it worked. The perfectly sized clothing kept the birds warm.